Welcome, Eliza. Thank you so much. I'm yeah. delighted to be talking with you. That's great. Uh, having you over here. So you you are an entrepreneur. You are an investor. So you do really a lot in the in the collaborative economy. You wrote a book, uh, The Mesh: uh, Why the Future of Business is Sharing. So why is the future of business sharing? Tell me. Well, that's uh, you're singing my song. Um, I think that we've hit a threshold. We've we've hit an inflection point, where. Um, we have many assets, many talents, physical goods, and capacity that is distributed um, very elaborately around the world. Um, but it's the where these things are don't uh, align with when and where we need them. And so um, one, one really interesting thing that's happened in the last 10 years is not only have these kind of physical assets, so cars, bicycles, in the, our, in the private sector, homes, uh, been purchased and distributed and built in many places and is sitting around, but also um, talent and um, many of us have hidden talents, I'm sure you have several, but, um, but also just talent in the world in general, um, people who have uh, arrived at a place in their career where they want to do something else, um, people who are coming, just coming into their career and exploring different talents. Um, there are many of us that are kind of, n n kind of, uh, how would I say, being unleashed. You know, the old model of uh, maybe this is a good way to start that I refer to last century as the century of the generals. It was top down, um, one to many kind of a military model, you know, don't worry, we have this handle, just do what I tell you. Yeah, trust me. Uh, trust me, yeah, just execute on the plan. Um, that model is, um, is very last century. You know, it created a, this, this very hierarchical way of thinking. Um, companies were patriarchal, they needed to take care of us. Um, we had a job in a company and then got promoted within that company that was called a career. This century is a totally different model. We have different tools, different capacity, questions, challenges, curiosities, and, um, and those are inviting us to work and think and play, create communities and create marketplaces in really different ways. And so um, sharing, you know, from my perspective isn't new. And I, I think we've all grown up sharing um, as kids. Certainly sharing is tribal. It's been around for thousands of years. But what is new is um, that technology is allowing us to find each other in things just when we need them. And so in many ways, um, technology has taken the friction out of sharing or collaboration. Um, secondly is that the, the old model was very complex. So we, we were just talking that um, Kodak, for example, a company that I, I started a company called Ophoto with uh, some friends and sold the company to Kodak in 2001. And we were the largest digital photography platform and um, at the time. And I then went to Kodak and ran digital for several years. Well, Kodak is an example of last century's model. It was vertically integrated. It, it owned the cows to make the bones, to make the auger, to make the film that no one buys. And so one of the things that we see when we look at these collaborative economy companies and communities is this idea of resilience. That um, it took six years for Airbnb to build something with 650,000 rooms that the Intercontinental Hotel, the largest hotel chain on the planet, took 63 years to build 650,000 rooms. Um, the differences are many, you know, the, besides being 10% of the time, it's also that, um, uh, for example, um, Airbnb owns no inventory, the Intercontinental owns all of its inventory. And when there's a demand surge, like for example, the Olympics come to town, or there's a really big storm like Superstorm Sandy in New York, one of the things that happens is suddenly there's a big uh, demand on uh, the need for places to stay. Um, hotels can't accommodate that. They can't kind of mix something with water and blow up really fast a hotel and have a new uh, property. But 
with a two-sided marketplace, with these peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces, the dynamic of the marketplace is really different. And what we're doing is we're tapping into this excess capacity. My way of saying is unused value equals waste. That things that we value, talent, physical goods and services, when we're not using them in that second, and now we can see second by second because the technology allows us to make something that was invisible visible. And, and, and when you look at, <coughs> because it is, uh, when you look in, in what kind of companies are in the declarative economy, there are mostly uh, startup young companies. Uh, why do you think like with a Kodak example, uh, why, uh, what, what is the problem with, with existing organizations? What, what makes it so hard to tap into this collaborative economy? Uh, so the, I think you're asking a great question and I hear actually in a way two different questions. One is, um, you know, why is it difficult for bigger companies who are established to tap into the collaborative economy? Um, and the other one is, I think, asking about why are startups attracted to this model? Um, the first one is to say that I think some big companies, established companies in many different industries, manufacturing, transportation, finance and banking, um, fashion, food, um, have begun to explore, uh, you know, how do we begin to play in this space in this, with these new models. Um, to those companies, and there are many, um, General Electric, um, BMW, Ford, many actually in the mobility, in the auto industry, man many auto industry manufacturers in particular, mm -hmm. so car makers, over the last five years have mostly redeclared that they are in the mobility business because they realize that people don't necessarily uh, need to own a car. And increasingly, starting several years ago, but increasingly, uh, people around the planet are o less and less owning cars. And so that shift from kind of a desire to aspire to own things, either as an individual or as a business, I think is one of the key things behind the collaborative economy. It's shifting from um, a world that was organized around ownership to a world in which access to talent, goods, and services triumphs ownership. Um, the, the, the big corporations are having challenges because they are married to a business model, one, um, in many cases. So it's very challenging to continue to build out your current business model, especially if the company is a public company. Um, then the expectations are that every three months you have to show something good happening. So it's, if you think that your market is eroding, if you think that your business model is changing, you um, could ask, for example, retailers who have a lot of retail space, do you think if you were starting your business today, would you actually have those places? Would you have that much physical space in those exact locations? Or if you ask another retailer that we call a bank, who has a lot of branches. Um, if you were starting your business today, knowing what you now know about the future, what would you consider you thought was an asset that you now realize could be a liability? And in those questions, you can begin as a, as a shareholder, as a business manager, and as an entrepreneur to begin to, to say, ah, you know, maybe bank branches, for example, they're, we're not using them as assets. They're, we're, they cost a lot, but we're not really getting value out mm -hmm. of that. Or there's extra capacity in our fleets or our um, manufacturing facilities or our, our shipping facilities or um, we have intellectual property that we're not using anymore. All of those things are value and when they're sitting around, they're wasted. Yep. Um, and so I think what we're seeing, what we've seen in the last um, three to five, six years is um, the beginning of an exploration by startups and um, large corporations uh, asking the question, what are the new business models and how do they apply to me? Um, GE, for example, has formed a partnership with a company that does crowdsourced inventions. 
and they had a, they, they did a very bold thing, I think, which is to take uh, their patent portfolio, billions of dollars in, in research, and form a partnership with Quirky, uh, making their patent portfolio available to an international community of engineers, designers, inventors. Um, and so those patents can be applied because GE had decided that they weren't going to go into the consumer business anymore. They sold off their appliance business and they decided that to take these um, patents and make them available on the crowdsource platform gave the international community the, the ability to use this intellectual property and create new products for the consumer market. But that, but that, 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 that does uh, require a, a really special kind of leadership, but also uh, leaders that, uh, that will get the, 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 the space to, to, to make this change. Uh. Completely. I mean, the leadership is, the, I think there's several stages for the leadership. The first stage is to say, wait a second, something's happening in the world that we don't maybe understand fully and it's happening right in our industry and it's happening with and around our customers. How do we get connected to that? How do we start to experience that and how do we start to learn about it? Um, the second, and that's the exploratory phase and we've seen a lot of companies um, hire consultants, talk to people like you and me, say, please be my decoder ring, tell me what's happening, how do we play here? The second phase is experimentation, is saying, well, you know, let's start, let's start somewhere, let's create 20 experiments, very small, and let's start learning, let's see who trusts us for what, what, what kinds of companies could we partner with that would give us an experience? And so, for example, um, Daimler purchased Car2Go, as, but then from there they've actually left it alone and allowed it to become the, the kernel of the, the kind of future of their mobility platform. Uh, GE has Eco Imagination Challenge. They created a crowdsourced challenge platform. Um, my particular bias for a lot of big companies is crowdsourcing and crowdsource challenges in particular are a really great way to start to kind of get your brand out there, to partner with someone, and to begin to learn, to see like how, how different the world really is. Because when you start to like experience, that, open that door and really dive into, soak into all of the things that are happening around the world, the hundreds of thousands of experiments and the amount of ingenuity and curiosity and innovation that's taking place at a really rapid pace. Um, the first thing I think that happens for you know, executives that, that you, you've been alluding to is uh, something like panic and fear. Like, oh my God, I can't believe how I, I'm, I feel so old, I'm so out of it, this is, this, maybe this will go away. Um, but now we see, like for example, um, blockchain, Bitcoin, peer-to-peer -peer currency is now a central topic for banks and finance companies. You know, I would say certainly a year ago, but even six months ago, most of them were, were saying, you know, this is probably something that won't really stick. Mm -hmm. And now I think you could interview anyone in, in a bank anywhere in the world, certainly several really wonderful Dutch banks, um, Rabobank and others, uh, have started to explore cryptocurrency and, and playing with this peer-to-peer -peer model. Um, so it is threatening to the, to the generals. It's threatening to the to last century's model. But if we don't uh, learn and, and connect to, um, to organizations, to communities, and to the ingenuity that's out there, mm -hmm. the collaboration won't emerge. And, um, and then, you know, the, like Kodak, the whole model will die. So, um, yeah, you but know. sometimes what's wrong with dying? It's sometimes yeah, you, there's also a point to say, okay, I've been really valuable for the world the, the last 50 or 100 years or five years, and now it's it's It's, it's time over. for something else. Yeah. Uh, you're right. And so I think that um, if you take that perspective, nothing. The answer would be nothing's wrong with it. However, for most um, executives and shareholders of corporations, <laughs> they would, you know, like to see a different outcome. 
And so for those people, I think, you know, the peer-to-peer -peer model um, is very powerful. It's, I was saying with comparing Airbnb and the Intercontinental Hotel, the Intercontinental Hotel is a lot far less resilient. Um, Airbnb can, can tap into their supply side by inviting hosts to bring on new properties, um, more rooms, and in, an, in a surge, in a moment of, of demand surge, they can meet a supply and demand much better than the old model. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, should the old model die? Maybe so. You know, maybe it's time and something else. I mean, certainly, um, you know, one of the things I think that, that we talk a lot about in the collaborative economy is trust. And one of the things that um, if, if you look at, for example, the origin of insurance companies, um, mostly in Europe, of course, in Europe, the origins of things like um, hotels, which actually happened in the States, but, but was kind of uh, started in Europe and went bigger in the States. The, those two models are, you know, still around today, but they, in many ways, I think, for example, with insurance, we're going back to where it started, yeah. which was you and I decide that we're going to start a business and we kind of self-insure, yeah. you know? Yeah, so maybe it's also a cycle, like also the, 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 the Rabo Bank, uh, they are also a, a, a cooperation, uh, but yeah, now, they're, they're but, cooperative. But but now it's it's more marketing than than really the core of the organization. So what do you think? Uh, also, when we go to to, to the collaborative startups we see now, uh, what can we learn from from the mistakes that the banks and insurance uh, that really started as a collaborative initiative, that are really really collaborative, but something went wrong, uh, really wrong. W what do you think that's 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 the the startups that you are also investing in can learn? from them uh, and not make the same mistake themselves. So are you saying that when Rabobank was a cooperative that things went really wrong? No, but uh, uh, they really start as a couple of farmers uh, who want to, sh to, uh, to really share the, the, their risk. Yes. And, 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 and so that's really, really a, a really also collaborative model, but then really the old school offline version over 100 years ago. And, and, and now they're changing, or they're changed in, 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 in the years into a really large organization. Uh, and and uh, there, there were quite some things uh, went wrong and they're not really living the, uh, the, 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 the corporate model anymore. Yeah. What do you think that's, 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 that's the, the, the uh, collaborative economy startups uh, you're seeing right now can learn from that? Uh, so, I mean, that's a great question and quite complex. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a huge fan of sharing the, the value with the people who create the value. And so what I think is the first phase of the collaborative economy um, well, the first phase of the collaborative economy was probably many years ago when, when b before anyone was really talking about it, just the sharing. The technology enabled sh you know, collaborative economy that we're talking about, um, let's say the first phase of that was really focused on business models. It's still pretty much focused on business models. It's saying, let's take this idea of relay rides. You know, everyone has cars. They sit around 92% of the time. While they're sitting around, why doesn't someone use them? Or storefront, you know, extra spaces, many retail spaces sitting around vacant. Why don't we make smaller retail spaces and smaller amounts of time that you need to commit to them and allow them to be more activated and generate revenue, but also create value for the artist, the entrepreneur, and the community? Big ideas, um, really interesting all around the business model. And so this first phase has been kind of Uber, uh, Lyft, sidecar, um, blah, blah, car, mm -hmm. carpooling. Um, all of these models are tapping into, for example, with respect to transportation, how to get more out of what we as a global community already have. But I think the next phase of, of the collaborative economy is going to be focused on structure, is um, this first phase, and a lot of it is, as you've said, I'm, I'm an investor in some of these companies, so I'm benefiting by being a capitalist. Um, at the same time, I would say that uh, the, the idea that you drive for one of the, one of the ride-sharing companies, mm -hmm. 
or you are an artist on 99 designs or you're contributing in many of these you're a designer in one of these marketplaces um, you know what do you get you, you get the value of your transaction but when the company itself becomes wor worth 30 or 40 billion dollars and goes public let's say mm -hmm. the benefit of that huge value creation is only captured by the investors and the founders and so different than other business models if we're truly creating a collaborative economy I think that the next phase will be less f kind of focused on solely the old venture capital model and either a modified venture capital model or other ways of raising the necessary money so that the people who are the providers or the producers, the supply side of these two-sided marketplaces, will actually be able to benefit. And we've seen some evidence of that already um, in that Reddit has just raised $50 million in venture money and they've committed to, to distribute 10% of their equity to their community. Mm -hmm. Now they haven't shared yet how they'll do that. But I'm saying all of this because I believe that we're going to return to a, um, a collaborative, cooperative structure. Yep. And I believe also that the, in the same way that sharing isn't new, that we had ride sharing 40 years ago in Switzerland, for example, mm -hmm. but it was a blackboard with keys and people you knew in the area and you had to come and exchange the keys physically. So that doesn't really scale. In the same way that technology has allowed a lot of these models to scale, I think that um, technology will give us real innovation on the side of governance, of transparency, and trust in the way that will make um, cooperative models more scalable and less painful. Because and, 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 and what do you think has to happen to, uh, because I, I, I really, also believe in the second phase and I, I'm really grateful to the Uber and the Airbnbs for paving the way uh, with, uh, with their, their, yes. their, 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 their activities and also their budget. But uh, uh, what do you think really has to happen to make this collaborative economy, and you also mentioned the cooperation economy, uh, and what has to happen to, to, to make it a, a sustainable model uh, in the future? So I think, we're, I think we collectively are in the experimentation phase in that sense. And I'm not so arrogant as to believe I have the answer, <laughs> but, I believe, <laughs> but I believe that um, we're just in the beginning of, of experimenting. I think that we, we are collectively looking at models like cooperatives because they had, a, they had certain aspects of them were very thoughtful and, and work quite well. Um, there's also the B Corporation model in, in the U.S. that s says, I'm for profit, but I'm, I'm a benefit corporation. I'm not all about profit. Yep. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're kind of, I'll call them early experiments to see, uh, and, and there are certain companies that have led the way, for example, Patagonia, the outdoor clothing company, has done many things that look counterintuitive for a company that's for profit. Um, yet they've continued to grow their business and do, do things that they feel are creating um, social capital. I, I think that we are increasingly um, uh, giving value as a community, as a global community, as um, entrepreneurs and as um, people moving around buying things or participating in these marketplaces. We're continuing to give value to social capital like increasingly so. It's, um, it's increasingly important for you and I to understand, you know, is this company, are they good? Are they good actors? Are they jerks? You know, should we yeah. trust them? But also, are they, are they treating their employees well? Are they treating their community well? Are they treating their suppliers well? Are they making the world a better place? Or are they just greedy jerks? Um, because greedy jerks, we're, 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 I think, I hope that we're finished with that as a theme. You um, think so? <laughs> I, I, I'm, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> yes. But I, you know, it, it's, um, it's like one of those B, uh, those B horror movies where, you know, the, you think the monster's dead and <laughs> no. 
<laughs> they turn around and um, so I, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm, I'm very minimally, I'm skeptimistic. Uh, I tend towards being optimistic about the future. Part of that reason is because the crowd is the community, the crowd is the company. You know, we have increased transparency around um, who's there and what, what we and they are capable of. Um, so the ability to tap into the riches and the ingenuity and the creativity and the power of the crowd is something that I, I really think we have not yet really experienced. Yep. And, um, and a big part of, I think, what, we're, what, what I personally have been um, learning a lot about and um, experiencing myself is um, this idea, what I call sort of, we need a new social operating system. We need a new way of learning how to be together, how to run companies, and how to be a community member. Um, and I think that it's a kind of a cocktail or a blend of mm -hmm. the cooperative thinking, the corporation thinking, the, the, the kind of um, community, the commons thinking, um, and a lot of things coming together to, to create something that makes sense and it will be different you know for for it will work different in the Netherlands in the in the city than it will in the country it will work differently in in Brazil than it will than it will work in yep. Vietnam um, and I think that's also a big part of what we've been learning in the last four or five years is you know these models are horizontal they they make sense in a lot of different industries and geographies but they need to be um, shaped. They need to be respectfully crafted by the people who are participating. Yep. Otherwise, the shoe doesn't fit. And I think last question, because you have to go to your next uh, next meeting. Um, what do you think, uh, looking at the short term, um, uh, that, that, that like a government can do to lower the threshold uh, to, uh, to make this a collaborative economy uh, grow faster and also uh, that people can participate much easier uh, f f from the uh, startup and the uh, user uh, per uh, perspective? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I, I think that, by the way, Amsterdam has been a great city for that. Um, and I, th I think there's been several others around the world. Um, uh, my point of view is that it's almost like I feel like we need an innovation permit. You know, we, um, permits and regulations are, are tend to be organized around things that are well understood and that we know what consequences we're trying to avoid. Um, and it's, it's, it's um, a danger to regulate something prematurely because you may have basically thwarted the innovation on the other hand, the balance, of course, is that trust and safety is really important. Um, and so I think, to answer your question, um, m many city governments especially have been leaning in the direction of exploring innovation, not regulation, not, not hiding behind regulation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I've been wondering whether there's a kind of like inno innovation permit, a, a way to say, essentially, you're in a, um, like you would sort of say to a, a teenage kid, right? Where you say, you know, we trust you for some things. Some of your ideas are good, but we're not going to run around necessarily and c assume that you're, you know, ready to be unleashed on the planet. So, you know, let's try, you know, three months or six months like this. We're going to learn these things together. We want to understand these things a little bit more. We're not going to stop you from operating, but we're going to, we, we want to sort of, um, you know, kind of put training wheels on. Start here, and then once we understand this, and we're not gonna, our job is to move you through the process faster and tell you what's needed for you to, to achieve these things. Um, we're not gonna be opaque, you know, yeah. we're gonna be transparent, yeah. but we're also not gonna give you the keys without having some, some understanding of how your business really operates and how it will impact our citizens. Yeah, interesting. So, thank you for your time. And I think we'll meet again in, in Paris uh, next year. I'm looking forward to yes. that. Yes, and uh, thank you. Thank you, thanks very much. 
Martijn, thank you so much for all your questions. And I realized that one of the things that you asked me, I want to just revisit, which is, you know, this question about what can corporations and what can governments do and how can we move faster? And um, the one thing that I, the one word I would say is um, openness. You know, be open because one of the things that life has certainly taught me personally and the last seven years of doing this exploration and working in the, the collaborative economy has taught me is we simply don't know where the next great idea, huge challenge, big innovation, opportunity, coincidence, if you want to call it that, is going to come from, right? Yes. Yeah. And so I have learned that just don't assume that this is, you know, just a, a ride to a place. Don't assume that this is just a, a simple tea with someone. You know, don't don't assume that the person sitting next to you or the, you know, the weird email interaction that you just had with someone is 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 you know, weird and dismiss it, just dismiss it out of hand. Because in reality, serendipity and um, innovation and the crowd, this whole notion of um, that we're more connected than ever before on the planet and that we are, whether we like it or not, connected. We depend on each other. And the level of interdependence is um, maybe for some people uncomfortable. But when you accept it, it's actually extremely comfortable and powerful. Uh, so I would just say, I've, I'm every day I'm still learning this, but I would, especially for big corporations and for entrepreneurs alike, I would say just the mantra is be open. You really don't know where the next great thing is going to come from. <laughs>